Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 812 for March 29th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. We have an, for a lot of organisms that are not as important as oak is to the American hardwood industry, but not only that, the bourbon industry. So it's just a really important step one that does that longevity of, uh, of protection and sustainability for, the, for these, the resource. We're going to get into some of the science that's being done to advance the knowledge of what makes whiskey unique. For instance, whiskey makers around the world rely on Carcass Alba, the American white oak. But just what makes that species of oak tree unique from other types of oak? And how do we protect the species for the future? Seth DeBolt of the University of Kentucky is leading a project involving the U.S. Forest Service and several other universities to sequence the DNA genome of American white oak. We'll also meet Stuart Williams of the University of Louisville, who's come up with a unique way to fingerprint whiskeys. In fact, it's something you can even try at home. We'll hear from both of them later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and a whole lot more. Sit back, pour yourself a dram, and relax. After all, the coronavirus can't be spread by podcasts. It's time for this week's Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking, winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And we'll start with the latest developments on the coronavirus pandemic first. Help is on the way for struggling U.S. distillers, though it's not clear yet whether they'll benefit enough from elements of the $2 trillion economic stabilization package approved by Congress on Friday and signed into law by President Trump hours later. In addition to the financial help for other small businesses, there was one part of the package specifically put in to help distillers. It would allow them to avoid paying the federal excise tax for alcohol produced to use in hand sanitizers and disinfectants, as long as those products meet with Food and Drug Administration standards. And there's the rub as in rubbing alcohol, pardon the pun. As of this weekend, the FDA is refusing to approve the use of alcohol-based sanitizers that are not made with so-called denatured alcohol, which is alcohol that has had additives put into it to keep people from drinking it. The agency's concern is that children might get access to those sanitizers, and without the additives that make it bitter, they might drink enough to be poisoned. That means unless the agency changes its guidance, distillers that have been making alcohol for use in hand sanitizers for the last two weeks will be on the hook for federal excise taxes. Chris Swanger of the Distilled Spirits Council told us on Friday's live Happy Hour webcast that they'll be working this week to resolve the issue. We still have some work to do, working with TTB uh, and, and the FDA. Uh, to iron out the details on the federal excise tax, but now that the president has signed the bill, we'll be able to do that, and I do have some confidence we'll, we'll, we'll get there with the FDA and, and TTB as well. Part of the problem is that one of the FDA's approved denaturing agents is isopropyl alcohol, which is in extremely short supply already because of the demand caused by the coronavirus. Other approved denaturing agents can leave residue behind in distilling equipment that could be dangerous when distillers return to making whiskey and other spirits without extensive cleaning first. 
U.S. distillers have largely been complying over the last couple of weeks with the World Health Organization's standards, which have more flexibility for using undenatured alcohol. Sunday, 87 members of Congress sent a letter to FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn urging him to relax the standards during the coronavirus crisis to allow the use of undenatured alcohol. The British government unveiled its own economic relief package for businesses last week, but Scotch Whiskey Association officials are asking for a clarification on a few key points. Part of the plan announced by Chancellor Rishi Sunak includes business tax relief for bars, restaurants, and the rest of the hospitality industry, but the SWA says that relief currently would not apply to distillery visitors' centers, gift shops, and cafes. Distillers also faced a whopping tax bill this week. Their next round of excise duty payments was due on Wednesday, and the SWA asked for a six-month suspension of duty payments to help distillers work through the crisis. Scottish Finance Secretary Kate Forbes also called on Sunak to give UK distillers the same tax break on alcohol production for hand sanitizer use that the U.S. government has done. There's no word yet on any response from the Chancellor's office. We are supposed to find out this week whether many of the distilleries that closed down visitor centers earlier this month as the pandemic worsened will be reopening soon. Many had originally cited plans to close until the end of March or this coming Friday, April 3rd. However, it's becoming less and less likely that any of those facilities will reopen anytime soon. Irish officials have ordered a near-complete lockdown of the entire country until at least April 12th now, and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said the worst is still to come for his country, while announcing Friday that he himself has tested positive for the coronavirus. However, many whiskey companies in Scotland are still continuing to produce whiskey, and some are making hand sanitizer as well. That's led to a call from the GMB trade union demanding that Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon order the distilleries closed unless they can ensure safe working conditions. The GMB is one of the two major unions representing whiskey workers in Scotland. Unite is the other. It's also demanded that Diageo shut down its distilling and bottling facilities as well. Diageo spokesman told the Spirits Business this week that the company is complying with all government-mandated safety protocols and challenged union leaders to provide specific examples where worker safety is being jeopardized. We also received word this week that Beam Suntory has temporarily suspended production at its distilleries in Scotland, including Laphroaig, Beaumore, Glengarry, Auchintoshan, and Ardmore. Glen Farkless Distillery in Speyside also shut down production completely this week to protect the health of its workers. In other news now, Kentucky distillers could be able to start shipping whiskeys directly to consumers as early as this July. State lawmakers have passed a bill that opens up direct-to-consumer shipping to a new level, depending on how many other states decide to go along. Eric Gregory of the Kentucky Distillers Association calls it a natural evolution of the state's bourbon boom. Back in 2018, under House Bill 400, uh, we allowed you to ship to consumer if you came in to one of our distilleries and made an in-person purchase. Uh, this simply just removes that in-person requirement. And now, uh, if you're in a reciprocal state, you can take online or telephone orders and ship directly to the consumer. How many reciprocal states do you have right now? You know, I asked my, our lawyers that this question. We're still around, you know, eight or ten in the, in the District of Columbia, but uh, a lot of states have been following this uh, very closely. Uh, I've talked to guilds in Florida, New York, uh, Tennessee, Missouri, California, Texas, uh, you name it, that have really been watching to see what Kentucky does uh, and wants to use our legislation to kind of model and their states. The bill now goes to Kentucky Governor Andy Beshear. He has 14 days to sign it, veto it, or let it become law without his signature. New laws traditionally take effect on July 1st in Kentucky, 
unless another date is specified in the legislation. The coronavirus pandemic is leading to a new phenomenon, virtual whiskey festivals. For instance, Tomatin is sponsoring the Lockdown Whiskey Festival this coming Saturday on YouTube, and at least nine other distilleries will be participating. We'll post a link in the show notes at whiskeycast.com. And in Australia, after the organizers of Whiskey the Show, set for April 18th in Melbourne, had to cancel their event, they decided to take it online as a virtual festival, too. Ticket holders will be sent a box of 10 milliliter samples that would have been poured at the actual show, and they'll be able to use a smartphone app to guide them through samplings at their own responsible pace. The tickets are $75 each. Once again, we'll have a link for more details in our show notes at the WhiskeyCast website. While Whiskey Magazine had to cancel its annual awards dinner this Thursday night in London and reschedule it tentatively for August, the magazine announced its award winners on social media Thursday. The magazine's latest Hall of Fame inductees are John Glazer of Compass Box and Danning C of Seedman Company in Taiwan. He's the distributor for White and Mackay's range of whiskeys in Taiwan. In the Icons of Whiskey final showdown, Irish Distillers was named the Distiller of the Year, while Dad's Hat in Bristol, Pennsylvania was named Craft Producer of the Year. Billy Walker of the Glenallachie was named Master Distiller slash Blender of the Year, while Westland's Scott Sell was named Distillery Manager of the Year. South Africa's James Sedgwick Distillery won the honor for Sustainable Distillery of the Year, and the longtime manager there, Andy Watts, was named the World Whiskey Ambassador of the Year. Georgie Bell of Dewars was named Scotch Whiskey Ambassador of the Year. Avril Hogan of Dingle won the Irish Whiskey Ambassador of the Year Award, and Thalia Alvis of Brown Foreman took American Whiskey Ambassador of the Year honors. Buffalo Trace was named the Visitor Attraction of the Year, and former ScotchWhiskey.com editor Becky Paskin was named the Whiskey Communicator of the Year. She joined me Friday from her home in Brighton, England, on the Happy Hour live webcast. It was funny actually because I was right, uh, I was right in the middle of doing tasting notes. Um, so my head was down. I kind of like knew it was happening in the the background, but because I was so involved in the whiskey in my glass, um, I wasn't checking um, to see what was happening. And then my phone just started buzzing. Um, people messaging like, "Oh my god, have you just seen what's happened?" Uh, that was that. I mean, that's lovely. That's really nice to see. You can watch the entire webcast on our YouTube and Facebook channels. In the World Whiskies Awards. Suntory's Hakushu, 25 years old, was named the world's best single malt whiskey by the judges. Dewar's Double Double, 32 years old, won the world's best blended whiskey. Redbreast, 21, the world's best pot still whiskey. Iron Root Harbinger was named the world's best bourbon, while Archie Rose Rye Malt Whiskey from Australia won the world's best rye whiskey award. In a bit of a surprise, Rebel Yell 10-year-old single barrel was named the world's best single barrel bourbon. And it was even a surprise to Luxrow master blender John Rempe. We were uh, incredibly uh, shocked, not, not really shocked, but, but you know, to receive an award like that, it, it, was, it was pretty awesome to find out. John Rempe's latest project is on its way to retailers now. The sixth annual release of his Blood Oath bourbon just like the previous five, this one is a completely different whiskey from its predecessors. I love being creative, so, but this one uh, is, uh, we got one of the whiskeys that I, that I rested in cognac barrels. So it, it just gives it a, uh, a slight little bit of like, uh, just a hint of uh, a little fruity character from, that, from the, the brandy that was aged uh, in those casks uh, coming all the way over from France. So in that good French oak wood, uh, giving it nice caramel. Uh, Get some nice toasted caramel chocolatey notes out of that barrel, too, that I, I was a little surprised to get. But uh, it's a really, really pleasant bourbon. Only 17,000 bottles of Blood Oath Pack Number no. 6 will be available. The recommended retail price, $99.99 bucks, 99 a bottle. I'll have tasting notes for it soon at the WhiskeyCast website. 
And we'll also post a link to a complete list of this year's Whiskey Magazine Award winners. One other new release to mention, Douglas Lang & Company is releasing a special Easter edition bottling in its old particular range. It's a 22-year-old single grain from Invergordon, distilled back in May of 1997. It'll be available exclusively through the Douglas Lang website for shipment to the UK, Europe, and Asia. The UK price is £85 a bottle. Finally, unless you work in the Scotch whiskey industry, you have probably never heard of Alan Gray. But for those who have made Scotch whiskey their career, he was one of the most highly regarded sources of industry information and analysis. He started out as an accountant and later became a financial journalist before becoming a stockbroker. In 1977, he created the Scotch Whiskey Industry Review and started tracking data that gave an honest and often critical analysis of whiskey industry trends. Alan Gray died this week at the age of 80, shortly after completing his 2019 edition of the Scotch Whiskey Industry Review. Our condolences go out to his wife, Margaret, and his sons, Barry, Colin, and David. Those are just a few of the headlines from this week. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent John E. Fitzgerald was patrolling the rickhouses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but also for himself. He was stealing a taste out of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side. Today's award-winning Larceny bourbon has that same soft, smooth character Fitzgerald loved. Look for 92-proof Larceny bourbon at your local retailer, and be on the lookout for the new limited-edition Larceny barrel proof. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distillery. First off, let's update the cancellations that we've received word about this week. Whiskey Live in Melbourne, Australia was set for May 8th and 9th, but has now been canceled because of the pandemic. As of now, Whiskey Live Canberra at the end of May is still on, along with the remainder of the Whiskey Live events in Australia this year. The Aaron Malt and Music Festival at Isle of Aaron Distillery in La Cranza, Scotland, was set for the weekend of June 26th through the 28th. The distillery announced this week that the festival is being canceled for this year. Refunds will be available for tickets that have already been sold. The Keepers of the Quake had already postponed this year's Spring Banquet to be held April 6th at Blair Castle in Scotland. That has now been canceled completely with plans for the Autumn Banquet this October still going forward. While there's no way of telling how long the lockdowns and bans on public events will continue, we are seeing more of this spring's postponed events being tentatively rescheduled for later this year in the hopes that things can get back to some sense of normal. Of course, the new dates should be taken as tentative at best, Make sure you're checking the websites for specific events that you're interested in before you make any travel plans. Waterford Distillery in Ireland was set to have its first ever open day and release its first whiskey April 25th. It has now been rescheduled for September 5th. The Whiskey Obsession Festival is moving from Sarasota to Tampa, Florida this year. It's now been rescheduled for June 4th. The Bristol Whiskey and Spirits Festival in Bristol, England, originally set for April 18th, will now be on July 18th. I mentioned the Spirit of Toronto Festival last week. It has now been reset for June 5th. Whiskies of the World has rescheduled its San Jose and San Francisco events. The San Jose Festival is set for June 18th and San Francisco's on the next night. The American Distilling Institute has moved its annual conference to be held this year in New Orleans until July 14th through the 16th, and Whiskey Advocate has rescheduled its first Big Smoke Meets Whiskey Fest until October 31st in Hollywood, Florida. 
If you're one of the many event organizers scrambling to reschedule your upcoming events, please keep us in mind when you're announcing your plans. You can always use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to let us know if you've had to change an event because of the coronavirus pandemic, and we'll be glad to help you spread the word. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. A special reminder from our friends at Redbreast, if you've ever wanted to visit Ireland, Redbreast wants to make that happen for you when things get back to normal, but you only have a couple of days left to enter. They're giving away a five-day, four-night trip for two to visit Ireland, and all you have to do is visit redbreastwhiskey.com slash Ireland and share your story of landing on Redbreast. The contest ends this Tuesday, March 31st, Terms and conditions apply, and one of those conditions is that it's only open to U.S. residents. Complete rules are available at the Redbreast website. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. There's a lot that scientists have yet to learn about whiskey. For instance, why can two casks filled with the same spirit and stored side by side in the same warehouse for the same amount of time? turn out so differently from each other. That's one they may never be able to figure out, but scientists around the world are looking at some of the other questions we have about whiskey and what goes into it. Take, for instance, Caracas Alba, the American white oak. It's important to a lot of industries, including construction, furniture, and for our purposes, whiskey barrels. The American white oak is the foundation for the bourbon industry, which filled 2.1 million oak barrels with spirit in 2018, just in Kentucky alone. Those barrels eventually find their way to distilleries around the world to be reused for years, decades in some cases. But what makes Kirkus alba unique, and how do we protect the species for future generations? Seth DeBolt is director of the University of Kentucky's Beam Institute for Distilled Spirits. He's leading a program spanning several universities and the U.S. Forest Service to sequence the genome of the American white oak. We talked at last month's Beam Institute conference in Lexington before the coronavirus pandemic forced U.K. and other universities to shut down their campuses. It's step one is to have a genome that you know every piece of code that makes that species unique. Because what you're going to need is, in order to track anything like disease resistance in the future, you need to know every code in order to identify what tracks with that trait of interest. And so without that, we're lost. We're at, we're at stage one. We have a genome for just about every organism on Earth. We, well, that's a stretch, but we have not for a lot of organisms that are not as important as oak is to the American hardwood industry, but not only that, the bourbon industry. So it's just a really important step one that does that longevity of, uh, of protection and sustainability for the, for the, the resource. How hard is it to sequence this, and uh, why didn't anybody think to do it before, or was there just not a need for it? It's very hard, and we have an incredible team, but you think of the the human genome was over a billion dollar project, and the, you know these these in order to sequence the genetic code of something, particularly something is um, that grows in the wild like oak and it's self incompatible so it's an out outcrosser so in order to i guess string everything together and have a reliable genome is going to take a couple of years and a lot of effort for a lot of people tell me about the tree that you sampled 
that is uh, estimated at 500 years old? It is just a magnificent tree. You've got to go see it, Mark. It's on the peninsula down there at Star Hill Farm at Maker's Mark and down by one of the big lakes. And it sits out on a, on a, on a little, a little uh, what do you call it, almost a point. And it's about half an acre and it just, it's just this beautiful specimen that's think through it's it's gone through the last 500 years of activity in uh, and seen so much but its circumference is just an enormous it's just a gorgeous specimen and immediately when we saw it we knew that was the tree that needed to be sequenced and uh it, it's just perfect we know that you can age a tree by counting the rings, but you have to cut it down to do that. How do you tell that this tree is 500 years old without cutting it down? The U.S. Forest Service, uh, Mark Coggershall, is the, a dendrologist and the, the, the person to talk to about oak and oak genetics. He did the breeding population up in Indiana, which is the only one to date. He did this 35 years ago, the start of his career, and that's allowed us to learn so much. And so he, he came in there and he said, that's got to be at least three to 500 years old. And th- that's where we get that number. But yeah, we're not going to go boring into that. We're going to look after that tree and make sure we protect it so it's around for another few hundred years. How did you take the samples, though, to do the DNA analysis on? Well, you have to take them in a very precise window, and that window is right now. So last year... We used a, an extremely long pole to cut off emerging buds because you can't get really high-quality DNA once the leaves are out. You have about a two-week window to capture that material to prepare that quality DNA for sequencing for. And so another way we, do it, we did it this year was you can use a rifle to um, excise branches very, very carefully and drop those down, and we got a lot of grafting material and extra material for doing the DNA preps this year. But with that short window, you got to be ready to go when, it, when the time is right. So nature gives us that window. We just try to get, get in line. Tell me about the research you guys are doing with taking acorns and doing the crossbreeding between different acorns and different seed stock for white oaks. That's just in its infancy, and that is uh, the U.S. Forest Service. Laura DeWald is really leading that project, along with Dana Nelson, who you met today, and the uh, forestry department at the University of Kentucky. And what it is is trying to collect a lot of those oaks from all over the place and get them growing. And uh, it's going to take years just to get the germplasm. And then it's about looking at how those express different traits. You know, Napoleon era in France, they did this looking for ship masts. That's why a lot of the French oak, you just see a beautiful, big, straight trees. Because it was just selection over generations and said, no, that's what we want. Uh, we, we've not done that. And in fact, you can think about it like this. You've, the selection has been almost reverse engineered because a lot of the white oak is on private landowners. So they chop the beautiful, straight tree and sell it because it'll fetch a lot of money. And they might use the the oak that's in the fence line to repopulate that forest but it might not have that really straight trunk and a lot of those desirable traits so it's almost like selecting the tomato plant that didn't produce the best fruit to produce the next generation so that's what they're going back and they're fixing that problem and saying no we were we weren't managing things in the optimal way let's do that Genetic engineering without splicing genes. There's n- yeah, genetic engineering is completely out for oak. There's no way. It's, it's not even feasible, really. So it's, that's not even a consideration. It's, it's breeding. The White Oak Genome Project is being supported financially by Maker's Mark and Independent Stave Company. This past week, I got a bunch of emails and tweets about an ArsTechnica.com story on the webs that some whiskies can form when diluted drops dry up. It's a discovery that Stuart Williams of the University of Louisville's Speed School of Engineering came up with. His paper on the process has just been published in the American Chemical Society's Nano Journal. He was showing off his work during the Beam Institute conference, and it turns out to actually be quite beautiful in a way. In fact, one of the images he's produced using a drop of Elijah Craig 23-year-old looks an awful lot like a brain scan made using MRI technology. 
Other whiskeys produce effects that look like something you might see from the Hubble Space Telescope. I had been planning to bring you our conversation for several weeks, but that whole coronavirus thing kept getting in the way. I've seen what happens when you put whiskey into a glass, let it evaporate into the Glencairn, and then you put it on a light table and shoot through it with a macro lens, and it creates these little webs. You've taken it one step further, haven't you? Yes, I have. So we're looking at this from an analytical perspective. Um, And you are right that the dilution matters. If you just take straight whiskey and evaporate it, it's going to form a film, which, which is interesting in and of itself. But you need to really dilute it to get these different structures. And what these different structures tell us from a scientific standpoint is it's a chemical fingerprint because chemistry is what drives this mechanism. And we hope to use this for quality control, counterfeitification, or at the very least, an artistic representation of bourbon that can increase the awareness of science. But it goes further than that, doesn't it? In your words, every bourbon is unique in the terms of this chemical fingerprint, right? You are absolutely correct. What we found out, we've tested over 100 different whiskeys now. That includes bourbon whiskeys, Tennessee whiskey, Irish whiskey, Scotch Canadian whiskey, etc. And so far... Again, there might be one that's out there that does do this, but moonshine does not create this. Irish whiskey does not create this. So that's why we are saying that it is unique to bourbon and unique to American whiskey because it's that new charred barrel. It has to contact that new charred barrel in order for this reaction, for this observation to occur. Why? We are still looking (laughs) into that. Um, But we believe it has to do with the solids content. Uh, At least that's the most simple way we can can say that. In that traditionally bourbon and other American whiskeys where it has that new charred barrel, you're going to have a higher solids content traditionally than others. And we believe that's a, a significant characteristic in what we observe here. What could this be used for? Quality control and and product identification, as well as just introducing or using bourbon as a bridge, as a vehicle to open science, an open scientific discussion. So if you look at these images and say, man, this looks interesting. Tell me more about it. Oh, this is bourbon? Tell me more. So it helps start that scientific discussion. So that's sort of that's the bigger outreach, I would say, in terms of the scientific community. But in terms of quality control, there are other more expensive options out. So so this might be a method of doing a quick quality control to maybe raise the flag to help maybe give insight into something else needs to be done. Further insight needs to be done to this analysis. Say, for instance, if somebody is at a bar and they suspect that the whiskey that they've been poured is not what they've ordered, or say if a bar is worried that somebody refilled a bottle with something, this could be a quick quality control check. Yes, this would be a quick quality control. Now, you won't see too many people with a pipette and with uh, some scales and, and a digital microscope in their pocket when they go visit a bar. But nonetheless, what your statement is correct. We still have a lot of investigations to do between now and then for how robust is this technique. That's a question that's still out there. But what you stated is, some, is a goal that we have in mind. You don't know whiskey cast listeners and what they take to bars. There are people who might very well do something like this, but you really don't need a digital microscope. You basically just need it. You can, you, you can do this with a smartphone. You, you are correct. There are some inexpensive, like I have a $7 Amazon ordered plastic microscope lens that you can just clip over your phone. And if you have glancing light, because that's one thing, you need light, light glancing from the side. So an LED, perhaps, or a ring of LEDs is the best then you have those combinations, and then if you know how to dilute your bourbon, which some people do, that's, that's all you need. And let it evaporate on a slide or something that you can put on top of a light table, for instance. Absolutely. Well, the one thing you don't want is you don't want it to spread out. You want it to beat up a little bit. And glass, clean glass does a decent job of having that beat up because that's part of what is needed for it to form this whiskey web structure. I'm thinking, say, if one were to turn one's smartphone screen white, as you can do with some of these apps that let you use it as a light, if you have two smartphones, use one smartphone as your little miniature light table and clip the uh, little doohickey lens onto the other smartphone, and you could do this on the road at a bar. Yeah, uh, perhaps. And and we are trying to investigate, we'll say, in the field analysis. Are there, what is the best portable, inexpensive way, method that you can sort of assemble and do this. 
So yeah, you're right. There might that might be a, a way to do this. What prompted this? <laughs> this was on accident. I was. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> uh, so I was on um, sabbatical. So I was uh, at a different researcher's lab, and I happened to have a case of bourbon with me, looking at a different investigation, but. We had this bourbon, and he was interested in evaporating drops. In other words, can you tell the difference between an expensive drop and a inexpensive drop and somewhere in between? And when we evaporated it, we got films. And films aren't exciting, but then we sort of said, okay, what can we do to this? There are some whiskey industries out there that dilute their sample for part of their quality control and part of their scrutinizing of their product because when you dilute it, other things happen. Some ugly things maybe rear their heads. In this case, when we diluted bourbon whiskey, this is where this happened. This is where the whiskey webs folded and formed. And that's the interesting concept that we had with respect to, oh, let's dilute this. Let's try this at different environments. Let's see what happens. And now we get to see that each of these whiskey webs is unique to different brands that we've, um, that we've tested so far. As Stuart Williams says, this technique is not limited to scientists with a lot of laboratory gear. In fact, his whiskeywebs.org website shows you how to do it at home. There's a link in the show notes for this episode at our website, whiskeycast.com. And that's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best-kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Art Begg confirmed one of the worst-kept secrets in whiskey this week when it unveiled the Wee Beastie, a new five-year-old single malt that's the youngest from Ardbeg since those Ardbeg Young, Very Young, and so on releases back in the mid-2000s. Wee Beastie's existence has been widely reported on social media for the last couple of months. I received a sample of it quietly a while back from a well-connected Ardbeg source with no details other than it was coming out sometime soon. Well, now we know... It's matured in a combination of ex-bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks and bottled at 47.4% ABV. The nose has the classic Ardbeg notes of peat and creosote, along with honey, barbecued pork chops, a touch of peppercorns, and hints of cocoa beans and garden herbs. The taste starts off with a nice chocolate maltiness, followed by a burst of peat, creosote, and grilled bacon, along with hints of menthol and anise in the background. The finish, long and briny with salted caramel, dark chocolate, lingering spices, and a hint of barbecue sauce. If they hadn't put a five-year-old age statement on it, you'd have a hard time figuring out that it was that young. I'm scoring the Yard Beg Wee Beastie a 93. Heaven Hill released this year's first batch of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof bourbon recently, Batch A120 is a whopper. It's bottled at 68.3% ABV. The nose is aromatic with notes of cherry cola, molasses cookies, allspice, pipe tobacco, and leather. The taste, intense and spicy, with black pepper, chili powder, and allspice notes that fade slowly to reveal cherries, pipe tobacco, and molasses. Adding some water is highly recommended with this one, it opens up touches of tree fruits and oak. The finish is long and spicy with a touch of oak, and I'm scoring the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof Batch A120 a 92. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey. It celebrates the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit sagamorespirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. 
Buna Havens 2007 French brandy finish was matured for its first eight years in ex-bourbon barrels, then spent the final two and a half years in French oak brandy casks. It's bottled at 52.5% ABV. The nose has notes of toffee, dried fruits, red grapes, a hint of chestnuts, and a clear brandy influence. The taste is dark and rich with plums, red grapes, subtle spices, salted caramel, chestnuts, and a hint of maltiness. The finish is long with dark fruits and a hint of oak tannins. I'm scoring the Bunahaven 2007 French Brandy Finish a 93. Finally, it's rare to see a single malt whiskey that's only been bottled in 50 milliliter minis, those so-called airline size bottles. But it does make some sense in this case. Sweden's High Coast Distillery collaborated with SAS Scandinavian Airlines on Atmosphere, which will be served exclusively in business class on SAS flights once things get back to normal travel-wise. It's one of the few airline-exclusive releases that I've ever heard of, and comes from a combination of lightly peated barley, along with ex-bourbon and virgin American oak casks. It's bottled at 46% ABV. The nose has notes of coconut cream, vanilla, a hint of peaches, and a subtle smokiness. The taste has a good balance of spices, oak and honey sweetness, with hints of vanilla and caramel candy. The finish is long, rich, and sweet, with a touch of oak and lingering spices. I'm scoring High Coast's Atmosphere a 92. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,800 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking, winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. A couple of reminders now. If you haven't seen our live webcasts from this past Thursday and Friday, they're available to watch on YouTube and on our Facebook page. We'll be doing more live webcasts this week. Keep an eye on our social media feeds for updates on days and times. Also, while your whiskey club may not be able to meet in person right now, we'd love to hear about your club. I'll be announcing April's Whiskey Club of the Month next time around. Each month, we pick a whiskey club somewhere in the world and send them two dozen whiskey cast Glencairn glasses to use at their club tastings. To put your club in the running, all you have to do is use the contact form at whiskeycast.com and tell us about your club. If you have a website or you're active on social media, we'll be glad to add a link for your club on our Whiskey Clubs page at the website, too. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. This past Friday was International Whiskey Day, which was created by some of Michael Jackson's friends a few years ago to celebrate his birthday on March 27th. For those of you who are relatively new to whiskey, we are not referring to the one-gloved wonder of pop music, but one of the original whiskey writers of the modern generation, and a role model for those of us who write about whiskey to this day. Michael died in 2007 of complications from Parkinson's disease. I posted a photo of a glass full of whiskey Friday on social media to mark the occasion. And longtime listener Ivan Stolyer shared this anecdote on our Facebook page. Thanks to Michael, I drink bourbon. The story goes he was in a bar or pub and the beer selection was piss or badly kept. That's when he added whiskey to his arsenal. About 1999, 2000 or so, the same thing happened to me in New York. I ordered a Sierra Pale, 
The bartender pushed it to me. It was flat and off. The schmuck took a stirrer, twirled it in the dead beer, and said, See, it's supposed to be like that. I looked behind him and ordered Knob Creek. Now I drink bourbon as well. Thanks for sharing that story, Ivan. I might have just walked out of the place instead. During our live webcast on Thursday, Greg Unrau asked if there was a supply issue at Bunahaven affecting shipments to Canada, since he couldn't find anything except the Bunahaven 25-year-old at stores in Alberta. Since Alberta has the most liberal liquor sales regime in Canada, you'd figure they should have it there. So I told Greg that we'd follow up and check with Mike Brisebois, the Canadian brand ambassador for Bunahaven, and the other Distel whiskies. Mike joined us live from Ontario on Friday's webcast with the answer. We got 160 cases that's supposed to land on April 7th in Alberta of Bunna 12. So, uh, you know, we know the love there. We want to make sure the product gets there. And, you know, you're mentioning earlier Bunna 25 is there. We usually don't have any there either. Uh, but uh, I was uh, shocked when you told me, you know, I think it was Greg who was mentioning that's the only one that was available at uh, one of the shops there. So, uh, you know, lots of uh, more interest over the last couple of years for Bunna and uh, we feel it and we want to make sure that we get enough stock for all of you that love this amazing whiskey and uh, more than happy to make sure that it keeps coming to you. Greg, I hope that answers your question. Just be patient for another week or so, okay? We all need a little bit of humor to help us get through these times. At Drew7182 on Twitter, had me laughing the other day with this hand sanitizer reference on Twitter. I can see it now. Purell Van Winkle. Instead of years, they use ounces to denote them. Purell Van Winkle 1523, Purell Lot P. For the record, the Van Winkle family did not respond when I asked whether they'd consider that idea. Just a reminder, gang, Wednesday is April 1st, April Fool's Day, and even with everyone taking the coronavirus pandemic so seriously, as we should, don't be surprised if we see a few whiskey-related April Fool's jokes on social media Wednesday. Maybe that's when someone will make my dream of a peated hand sanitizer come true. Just make sure you give everything you see on Wednesday a bit of skepticism. Unless, of course, you hear it here on WhiskeyCast. We'd never do anything like that. (laughs) I'm kidding, of course. If there's anything you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, except for the coronavirus, of course, you can always find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Now, we have focused a lot on science in this episode, but there is still one area we need to touch on again. A lot of distilleries have switched their production over from making whiskeys and other spirits to producing alcohol for use in hand sanitizer, but a few have openly said, we can't do that. It's not because they don't want to, but because their distilleries aren't capable of doing it. I know what you're thinking. A still is a still is a still, right? Well, it turns out that's not quite the case. Pot stills can make great whiskey, but they just don't have quite what it takes to make almost pure alcohol for sanitizing use. Turns out column stills do a much better job of that. Becky Harris of Catoctin Creek Distillery in Virginia is a chemical engineer by training, and during our live webcast this past Thursday, I asked her to explain. It's actually very difficult to distill alcohol to the the kinds of purity that's usually required for pharmaceutical ingredients. There's um, a couple standards called F- FCC and USP that are what are the FDA guidance requires us to use in um, these formulations for hand sanitizer. So we have even a hybrid 
um, pot still and with a column on it. And it does not get near to that level as far as being able to produce that level. So we are purchasing all the um, uh, the ethanol that we're using in this hand sanitizer project on the market because we were able to get an order in soon enough that there was still some available. At this point, there really isn't any in the pipeline. And that's the reason why I think that we're hearing more questions about, can we do something that would make it? When you read the, the World Health Organization formulation guidelines, what is the most important thing when the WHO is talking about making hand sanitizer for use around the world is they have a, a, an ability to use local production to get this. So they may not be able to get 96% ethanol in some of these far flung locales. And so what they said is that if you can get ethanol of sufficient percentage that you can still perform the formulation and get it to about 80% ethanol in the formulation in the finished product, that can be that that's acceptable and that you can adjust the formulation um, to do that. And I think that what we're seeing is a lot of our distilleries know that process. They know how to adjust that formulation so they could make a finished product that will meet the World Health Organization specifications. Thanks to Becky Harris of Catoctin Creek for the explanation and Full disclosure, again, Catoctin Creek is a sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Now, if you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today, Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events. And, of course, a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We know you have some spare time on your hands these days, gang. It's a good chance to catch up on past episodes. We love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.